Big Rock. Alfie Bo, welcome to Classic FM. Hello, thank you, Moira, thank you. Now, Alfie, you were the youngest of nine children growing up in Lancashire. So what are your earliest musical memories? My earliest musical memories, probably um, my father was a, my first educator in music. Mm -hmm. He had such an eclectic um, collection of, of records. And just from the description of, of who I am as a, as a performer, the love of music that I have all stems from his record collection. We had uh, albums by Benjamin Ogili, Enrico Caruso, mm -hmm. Luciano Pavarotti, uh, and all these gorgeous operatic um, box set of operas, uh, La Boheme being one of them. Mm -hmm. And um, then he had Glenn Miller records, big band swing, mm -hmm. and we had country albums, and, and then it went into the rock collection for like people like Elvis, Everly Brothers, and then even heavier rock than that, classic mm -hmm. rock. And, and um, so that was my first education. My first memory of music was listening to my father's favourite Franz Lehar song, You Are My Heart's Delight, yes. which happened to be my first audition piece that I ever sang to for the Doily Cart Opera Company. Why is the first favourite you've chosen from the opera La Vallée? Well, this is this isn't. It's not so much that it's one of my favourite operas, mm -hmm. but the singer is that I that I think I, I've listed was uh, the, was Maria Callas, um, and Maria Callas for me was um, one of the most passionate, emotional and heartbroken performers that I'd ever heard. Yes. My brother was a huge fan of hers, had lots of her albums, and I grew up listening to her a lot around the house. And the pain and the suffering that she went through, the ridicule because of her appearance and even the ridicule on her voice, um, it, it broke my heart. And I think listening to her sing, you can sense that in every note that she produces. When did you realise you could sing? Well, um, last week, <laughs> I, 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 I would say I knew I could make a sound, whether it was good or bad, I didn't know, mm. probably at the age of 13, 14, mm. once my voice had broken. I got to a point where I could sing these powerful notes, or to me what felt very powerful and energetic and vibrant and... And it just grew from there. I used to sing around the in the in my mother's dining room because that was where the uh, stereo system and record player was. And I would sing along to operatic singers, country singers, rock singers, um, Elvis, Freddie Mercury, all that. But the, when I used to sing the operatic stuff and and try and hit the same notes that Pavarotti could could hit, um, there was a, an occasion where I would hit a top A, and the cut crystal bowl that held the fruit um, would ring because it was at the same pitch as, a, as an A note. So I used to be able to make the cut crystal fruit bowls ring, you know, and, it was, it was, and so I knew that even with that happening, I was doing something yeah. right in a way. It was bizarre. But you became an apprentice mechanic at the age of 17. Why? Were you just crazy about cars? Well, that for me was the sensible route. You know, mm -hmm. That was like when you grow up in a in the north of England, um, you're told get yourself an apprenticeship, get yourself a trade, and when you've done that trade, you can um, go off and fulfil your dreams. But you'll always have something to fall back on, and that was what every kid in my sort of um, time period sort of uh, grew up knowing and, and and thinking that was the expectation that you had to fulfil, and. So I went into the local industry, um, and it was there, really, that uh, I, I, the urge to sing and the bug to get on stage just overtook me, you know. So I used to uh, sing in amateur productions while I was in my spare time. Mm -hmm. A customer overheard me at the car factory and, and, and advised me audition for a, for a company in London. Wow. Um, so I took the day off work, came to London, sang for the doily cart. Yes. And I never looked back. And that was did, you, the, did you ever see that customer again? I didn't. I tried to reach out to him, but when I rem, I'm looking out, looking back at it, he must have been 
for him to have known the Doily Cartop company, he must have been in his at least in his seventies. Yeah, yeah. Time, so yeah. probably no, no longer probably with no us. longer with us, unfortunately. What's been your favourite role on the musical theatre stage? Musical theatre stage. Wow, um, I think I'd have to hands down. I'd have to say Jean Valjean. Uh-huh. You know, playing that role has changed my life. Yes, um, give me a lot of recognition for um, my, my singing and for and for acting as well. And that role is something that's very close to my heart. I'll never forget it, and every, every opportunity that I get to do it, I, I jump at it, really. Well, you've been especially associated with the role of Jean Valjean in Les Miserables, and it's moved audiences to tears. But what does the role do for you? It moves me to tears. Hmm. It does. It moves me to tears. I get very emotional, um, at the, especially to, at the end, during the epilogue, because you look back over the life that you are acting out, and the memories and the love that you have for the other characters and the other roles in the show. And um, it does emotionally grab you. It gets you, it takes you. And it, But it's, it's, a, it's a role that I live with every day. It's not something I've ever let go of. Mm. You know, it's mm-hmm. very strange to say that. It's a character that just stays with you. And, you know, you can go and have a pint with him even, you know, ah. that sort of thing. What's it like being a part of that musical? It's um, a piece of history, mm. and to have your name associated to a piece of history is uh, an honour, really is. Mm-hmm. And the people you meet throughout the show, you know, the, the um, not just the composer of the piece, meeting Cameron McIntosh, working for Cameron, not just those guys, but the actual other performers on stage that you're with, the, the ensemble members. Mm-hmm. These I've seen so many of those guys grow in their careers and change and mm-hmm. develop and get opportunities and succeed off the back of doing their apprenticeship, if you will, in Les Miserables. And whether you're duetting or working with a full cast, would you say you prefer the elation of working with others or do you prefer working alone? That's interesting. I, In all honesty, I do love my own solo work. Mm-hmm. I, do, mm-hmm. I do love to work up by myself. When I do get to perform... Obviously, with my close friend Michael Ball, you know, it's it's wonderful opportunity, and we have a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. But for me, that was never the intention for my career. Mm-hmm. You know, it was it was it's part of my career, and and I love it and I respect it, and it's it's something that I don't want to stop. You know, um, but when I get the chance to um, embrace my own work, my own creativity, um, it, it's a joy. It's an absolute joy. Well, another classical favourite of yours comes from the soundtrack to the film American Beauty. Why is that special to you? Um, The the, the composer of of this piece, uh, Thomas Newman, is is just one of my favourite TV, one of my favourite movie composers. Um, Obviously, I'm a big fan of John Williams and and all those guys, but, but Thomas Newman just has something with his writing and especially in this piece the simplicity of the piano line just in in, it's it's just gorgeous for me and it just touches apart touches my heart so so deeply and my guest tonight on classic fm is the actor and singer alfie bow you've performed in front of some remarkable (coughs) audiences in some of the most iconic venues has there been a favorite performance it yeah i mean I think for me personally, it would have to be um, singing for Her Majesty the Queen. Wow. Yeah, singing for the Queen on her uh, 90th birthday at Windsor Castle. Yes. Um, standing on the balcony at Buckingham Palace for her Diamond Jubilee with the great René Fleming. Um, doesn't come better. Doesn't come better than that. <laughs> so I think <laughs> those are the moments for me. Now, your latest album is the Symphonic Songbook. Tell us what to expect. It's a collaboration of um, styles for me. Um, this is an idea that I had 20, 25 years ago when I first started my, my recording uh, career. And as it happened, it was here with Classic FM um, that I started uh, my recording career. Mm-hmm. And I did a full album of um, operatic arias. It was wonderful. And then I thought off the back of that, I would like to cover um, the classic rock 
um, songs that are very close to my heart, classic rock elements. Songs like Led Zeppelin, mm -hmm. her songs and Rolling Stones songs. But I wanted to also record them with a contemporary band, but also add in a full symphony orchestra. Back then, it was a very difficult sort of water to tread, you know, mm -hmm. because you have, you know, I was told by management and my personal management and agents saying that you can't do that. It's just too confusing. You have to be careful. You can't go from one extreme to the other. Mm -hmm. and everything has to be in a box. And and I just didn't believe it. I just thought this what, this beautiful world of music is just one whole world. And um, and so it's taken me 20, 25 years to fulfill that. Yeah. So I've now recorded an album called Open Arms of classic rock songs um, with a symphony orchestra and a contemporary musicians. Now, the next favourite you've chosen is the Prelude à l'après-midi d'un phone, and that's because... One of my favourite classical pieces. It really pictures an image of nature, countryside, um, uh, spring, that sort of vibe. But to be honest, it's, it's quite a saucy uh, piece yeah. when you see the ballet. It's, it is quite, and it got quite controversial um, reviews when it first came out, but um, you can't take away from the beauty of the music. It's Alfie Bow. Alfie, you've said yourself that you're a workaholic and it's wreaked havoc on your health. Yeah. So what happens now? I keep working. I keep working. <laughs> <laughs> and how are you dealing with balancing your life and your work? Yeah, I, I, I do love to work. I do love to work. And it, it, it's that is the thing that you that I've had to learn is the balance um, and how to cope um, it has played havoc at times with my with my mental health my physical health unfortunately my marriage um, but it's it's things like that that you um, grow from mm -hmm. and you learn from and you try to avoid those pitfalls again and just become stronger. I do love to work. I don't want to stop working, and I, I push myself harder and harder, um, but not to the detriment of my mental health, my physical health, or my relationships in my mm -hmm. life right now. It's important that. Is there perhaps um, part of you that wants to get into yoga or do any more ice baths? Or <laughs> I, I would do. I would do the ice baths. I don't think my body could could stretch in certain areas, you know, with the <laughs> yoga right now. But, but, but the ice baths are something quite spectacular, mm -hmm. I have to say. Those are things that people don't realise, oh, it's just sitting in ice and what is the ice doing? The ice is making you switch off yes. from the, the, the attack of the cold, you know, and wow. making you meditate. Wow. That's how it makes, that's what it does for me. And while you're meditating, do you make a sound or it, does it just, it, it, is there just the serenity of silence? It's silence, it's silence. And if I hear, if I close my eyes and I hear the ripple of the water that I'm in, I imagine I'm sat in a river in the middle of the mountains or whatever it mm -hmm. is and it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's beautiful. Back to the music and why have you chosen John Taverner's song for Athene? Again, um, this, this piece, I think it's, it's, it's most famous performance of this piece was was it was played at um princess of wales princess diana's uh funeral mm -hmm. on her her departure from westminster abbey and it was so heartbreaking mm. and you know seeing having that music over the top of the cortege you know leaving yes. and things broke my heart but it was actually written for a very dear friend of john taverner's who who had a sadly a bad accident and passed away and she was a very artistic person and it, and but you can sense the emotion that he went through with the loss of his friend in this uh, orchestration and you can hear that in just a few moments after this tonight is Alfie Bow. I hear you're a bit of a film buff I... and you've teamed up with Disney to try to settle the famous debate about whether Die Hard is a Christmas film. Well, that's... What happened? That's it. Disney Plus um, approached me and they said to me, would you like, would you like to um, figurehead this campaign for Disney Plus um, on whether or not, this debate, on whether or not Die Hard is a Christmas movie? And I said... 
I mean, that is an issue that I think the world needs to tackle. So I said, we need to sort this out once and for all. And so I, so I did. I, I sang uh, Ode to Joy, which features in the movie, but we did different lyrics, and the lyrics basically list all the reasons why Die Hard is a Christmas <laughs> classic movie. So whether you agree or not, it's a bit of fun. It's a bit of fun. And Disney Plus, you can stream it on Disney Plus and watch it and then decide for yourself if, <laughs> if you think it's a Christmas movie. Basically, you're just a rebel, right? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> What's next for Alfie Bo? Oh, my word. Um, for me, I take every day as it comes at the moment. I'm, I'm sort of living every day as it comes. But I do have plans for next year. A um, bit more theatre work. Um, another tour, brand new tour coming out um, May and June next year. Uh, it's called my on my uh, encore tour. Tickets mm -hmm. are on sale now for that. It's fifty percent sold out. I've just found out, and it only been on sale for four days, which is great. Um, Congratulations! But, so thank you. Yeah, you know, if you can get your tickets and come and see, it's a great show. It's a it's a storyboard of of music throughout my life, um, which includes classical and. Songs I grew up listening to with my parents and then now to where I am right now. So, yeah, and to balance on. that, how about, are you into cooking or writing or even sailing? I'm into eating. <laughs> I love to eat. I love to eat. I was at a, an opening of a restaurant last night and every opportunity I get, I'll go and try new foods out and all that sort of <laughs> stuff and, but I do love to cook I do love to cook Jamie Oliver is a good friend of mine Oh, and uh, he invited me to his new restaurant that he's opened and I um, but he's also invited me to go and have some culinary experience at his headquarters so I'm, I'm going to go and do that at some point and I find cooking is very similar to music food and music because the flavours the emotions that it creates the atmospheres that it creates exactly yeah. the same as music wow yeah. and so to another music favourite of yours the prologue from Peter Grimes what makes that piece so special to you? this people say to me um, do you have any roles that you would like to play? And I, I never say yes. I always say no, no, no. I wait for the roles to come yeah, to me. Yeah. But secretly, this is an operatic role that I would love to play, Peter uh, Grimes. And I was never a big fan as a student. I was never a big fan of Benjamin Britten because I didn't think that that music was something that was in my body to sing. Mm -hmm. I always thought it was the Verdi or the Puccini. But once I did Peter, uh, Albert Herring at Glyndebourne, I was hooked, and Albert Herring at Music College, I did it there as well, and I was just hooked into, into Britain, and this was one of my favourite operas. Well, I'm afraid our time is up. <gasps> no! <laughs> so, Elfie Bo, thank you for being my guest this evening, and for sharing your classical favourites. It has been so good to meet you at last. Bless you, it's been a joy. Thank you.